Olympia Kippis and Ashley T. And online, I believe we are joined by uh, Natalie Tremblay. And uh, we're here to uh, discuss a little bit about a project that we've been doing, investigating the interaction between Ontario Works Benefits and Arts Income. So I'm just going to very briefly give a little setup to the project, and then I'm going to ask Natty, who's been doing some research into the subject, to kind of uh, update us a little bit on some of the findings, and then we'll ask some questions for Anthea and Ashley about how is that playing out in the quote-unquote real world? So just for a little bit of background, I've been uh, at Sketch for close to 19 years now. And in that time, uh, participants who were receiving benefits in OW W asked to get paid in so many different ways so it wouldn't impact their benefits, including materials or, pa or paint or access to the studio or maybe a membership somewhere. Um, and those that did actually get, just took the money, sometimes they were end up getting clawed back. Uh, so this is a space that when we're working with folks that are experiencing poverty uh, or interacting in a very expensive city like Toronto, it's, it's actually, uh, there we go, it's actually really important that as arts organizations we're aware of what is the uh, impact of trying to pay people in this space. So, uh, Natty, are you with us? I'm unmuted. Natty here. Hey. <laughs> Hi, friends. Hey, Natty. Um, I would love for you to maybe start us off by just saying, like, I understand you've had some conversations with uh, maybe some Ontario Works workers, maybe some arts administrators. What are some of the early findings that you've uh, discovered? Really, really excited, happy to spend with all Ashley and Pierre. Julian, hey, love you all a lot. Oh, to say, um, my reach, I started with the uh, made up documents. Uh, so policies put out by uh, the federal government and the provincial government around OW and ODSP, how much people could make monthly and hold on to, uh, and also regarding self-employment. So some of the, there's a kind of a special program within OW and ODSP for folks who are self-employed. And one might say there are some benefits. And also there are some tensions and complications in that program. I, I look forward to talking more about that because um, you have to be approved to be uh, a part of the self-employed program. Um, and then also um, looked at some of the policies that came out in 2017 and 2018, specifically around arts grants and also language around recognizing artists as self-employed peoples, that it's a legitimate form of self-employment. And to say that um, like more often than not, when the government creates new legislation that might benefit working class and low-income peoples is because of uh, many, many peoples, artists, uh, arts organizations that did a ton of lobbying to specifically create a little bit more space and room for folks on ODSP and OW who identify as artists to be able to hold on to some of their arts grants and to be able to strategically hold on to a little bit more of their monthly or annual income through the self-employment program. So I read through all that stuff. It's pretty like dry nuts and bolts. And as is often the case with governmental legislation, there's a lot of gray space. Um, and that's what we wanted to dig deeper into. So I went to first some caseworkers in OW and ODSP, who I would for sure say uh, identified as allies to artists who uh, really um, see the value of, of and recognize the, the, the value of artists as um, contributors to society. So would say, yes, it's legitimate for them to be self-employed and that they could be financially independent because of course the self-employment program, that's the caveat. To participate in the self-employment program, you have to be able to prove, articulate and prove 
that you are you have an arts practice and that you could over time become uh, financially independent. And I and I, all of these things I I want to say with heavy quotation marks because there's it, I I would argue a lot of it is subjective. But so to say, the OW workers that I spoke to also acknowledged it's subjective. Why is it subjective? Because when you are sitting with your caseworker, they have bias. They may have beliefs that a young person who is saying, I am an artist and I want to, you know, expand my arts business. Can, would you refer me to the self-employment program so that I could retain more of my monthly income so that I could save some of my monthly income and reinvest it into my business, et cetera, that, um, that first step is being able to prove and get that approval from your caseworker, which means you would have to be able to sit with them and meet with them. And I just flagged that because those caseworkers acknowledged that most caseworkers today have to have a 200% increase in people they're supporting, which means they're not able to meet with them. They're not able to actually look at their business plan. And so it can take months and maybe even a year or more for someone to actually meet with their caseworker to get that approval. This is what I heard from the caseworkers. And it's also what I've heard from young people. Um, they also said that in order for a young person to be approved, it's, it's important you come correct. You bring as much documentation as possible. So a business plan, yes. A marketing strategy, yes. But also letters of support from arts organizations that would say, yeah, this person's done these trainings. We're mentoring this person. We support them. And I'm just drawing this link between caseworkers, young artists, and arts administrators to be explicit about the ways that arts organizations could better support young artists on the margins and also how young artists on the margins can ask arts organizations to better support us, <laughs> to provide explicit mentorship for how to articulate our vision for being financially independent. Is it even plausible? And I say that because if, for example, you identify as an artist for social change, your primary goal in your art practice might not be to commodify your art. It's not to say there is a right or wrong about commodifying your art, but it might not be that. So that's something to consider that you might be making art 24 seven, but you might, might not be able to argue to your caseworker, I can make money from it, or that's my intention. And that ultimately is the point. You need to be able to articulate that. And if you can, the caseworkers seem to believe that once you get referred to that self-employment program, other kinds of supports would kick in and you would thus be treated as a self-employed artist. And then you can tap in other resources. I don't know if you want me to get into that right now or pause, but that's certainly some of the stuff that I heard from caseworkers. And then again, I just want to say they really were, I, I really appreciated, quite honest, that you may still, because you're interacting with a human being, interface with their bias, which might include racism, homophobia, transphobia, classism, and assumptions about how serious young people are about their art practice, what they're doing, et cetera. And so those are, those are things that, those are real tensions, tension I say with quotation marks, that uh, each person negotiating with their casework would have to, to navigate. And there again, I say, tap in mentors and supports within arts organizations who can at the very least wrap around you and give you care <laughs> when you're going to your OW caseworker meeting. Um, Julian, is it helpful for me to go into what I heard from arts administrators or just kind of pause there? And that could be a little like tip of the iceberg summary. <laughs> um, that's a, a great start. Um, we have two incredibly uh, accomplished and strong artists present right, right now. Um, so I, I want to kind of see what their insights are a little bit, and then maybe we'll come back and talk to you about, the, uh, we'll ask you about the administration perspective. Um, but Olympia, I guess the first question is for you. Um, as an artist who has created a large body of work, who's done a lot of documentation around their work, who's uh, participated in vending in different areas, uh, do you feel like you, uh, the stuff that Nadi's talking about, like, have you ever heard about it in interactions with OW, or how does that play out with your own your own uh, artistic practice? 
Um, when it comes to ODSP, I uh, just don't talk to them as, like, well, I talk to them as little as possible because I don't have a worker and I never did. I started off, like, as a no fixed address at the old um, Evergreen location right beside it. And then it got uh, closed down, so I moved to the Wellesley office, then I moved into Parkdale, and was supposed to be given a worker, but there's none available, and that was like five, six years ago. So I get zero help from them on anything, pretty much. <laughs> they just send the money to my housing and my bank account, and that's it. Um, and I feel like that's a, a like, and that happens to a lot of people, but it's very detrimental because for me to even, like, talk to them about, like, getting grant money in and all this stuff, it would be a new person each time. So I feel like I'd have to teach them about this stuff they should already know each and every single time. And your appointments are usually an hour or two hours, depending on what you're doing. So if I spend the whole hour explaining what I need, who I am, why I need it, we barely have any time to work on it. And if I come back next, the next week, it's hard to get the same person again because it's not like she takes appointments, it's on call. So whoever's on call that day is who I see. So I don't know how that would even, how that could even, I feel like everybody sh in, o like working in ODSP should do a training about this stuff. Because I also don't think it's fair that we have to go and teach them things that they should already know. And also if they know, especially, maybe not in my case, because they don't know who I am, because I don't have anyone to know who I am. But if I had a worker, it would be useful for them. If they, I disclosed I was an artist, they would already know this information and could just help me. I didn't have, instead of me having to go there and show them, well, this is the law, so you have to do it to me. I feel like it's backwards. Thanks, Olympia. Um, yeah, as somebody who's previously on OW myself, I found the system very confusing and nobody ever offered uh, the additional insights into what was available. Um, so, uh, Natty, you also were having some conversations with some arts administrators, and before I ask Ashley to kind of respond to that side of the thing, uh, I'd love to hear what are some of the, uh, the conversations you've been having on that side? Julian, thanks, Olympia, for your answer also, and for that realness. Um, so what I heard from arts administrators was that in, in their kind of trajectory of working with uh, marginalized and low-income young artists, they didn't know about, they weren't really well-versed in uh, the implications of being on OW and o ODSP. They learned about it as they went along, which is to say just the, the basic stuff, like if you pay me, uh, cash over $200, I might be able to hold that money. If you pay me through your, uh, you know, your formal structures, more than $200, that will be taken from my OW and ODSP. But then in building more intimate relationships with young people, uh, consistently, there was this understanding like, oh, you don't, you're not writing arts grants because you're afraid that that money is going to, you're not actually going to get to keep any of that money. And that would have been legitimate up until really recently. If you got an arts grant and you were on OW or ODSP, um, any living expenses or artist fees would be deducted from your OW and ODSP each month. Um, so, but since 2017 slash 2018, that has shifted. And I just want to make sure I'm really clear. This is again, something that arts administrators didn't know because that's where they can mentor folks. If in your language, the language of your grant, you, you say artist fees and you input as much of your money into arts materials and equipment and capital stuff that you get to keep, um, you get to keep that. If you write living expenses in your arts grant, 
that will get extracted. And if you, uh, there's always the risk if you don't disclose it. And again, it's tracked by the government if it's coming through the government, like an arts grant through the Ontario Arts Council, the Toronto Arts Council, um, your caseworker could access that information. Could is the, is the, the word. Um, there's potential repercussions. And that's where I, I just really wanna flag tensions that again, arts administrators named they didn't know until things came up. Um, and so that's like, you know, that's a gap. I'm wanting to just highlight that that's a gap that previously they would have encouraged young artists to write grants and then they would end up being having money deducted or run the risk if it was found out that they got funding of having their OW rescinded or being kicked off the program. Obviously, for someone in ODSP, that's even more, you know, the stakes are that much higher because we know it's so hard to get onto ODSP. So, and granted, the amount that you can keep monthly in terms of monthly income is a little bit higher. This is a little bit higher than on OW, but we all know, and it's important to say, it's not a living wage that you're getting on OW or ODSP. And if you, you know, retain $100 more than the 200 max that you can get um, penalized for that. I also just want to say from my own politics, it's amazing that corporations can <laughs> avoid paying taxes in the millions, but we can get penalized for <laughs> retaining $100 you know, monthly uh, payment, but I digress. Um, arts administrators, I also really heard from them um, that um, they didn't know about these new pieces of legislation about the arts grants for folks on OW, on OW and ODSP. And they didn't know about this particular program, the self-employment program, and that they could encourage young people and support young people to get on that program. Um, that, that, and I think very few people know that. I think that that is true, and that's an opportunity for artists and arts organizations to get that word out. Because I also heard that from young people, young artists on OW and ODSP. I want to say I also just tested this with some of my family members who are on OW and ODSP, who are artists and have been on, you know, receiving benefits for a long time, who did not know that they could apply for the self-employment program as artists um, and didn't know anything about those benefits, so to say that is a, an important role that we can play also in addition to training caseworkers. Um, also is letting arts administrators know there's so many ways that you can support folks, but it also requires legitimacy, which is to say like a solid business plan, a solid like one year strategy for how you'll use your money, all that kind of stuff. And just being real with folks about the tensions. And I'll just keep saying, and I've heard this from so many young people, why would I disclose this? Why would I disclose this and run the risk of having my money taken away from me? Why would I disclose this, that I've been being paid for my arts practice? And actually I'm like, shout out Ashley, who I think said this to me yesterday. Why would I disclose that I've been being paid in my arts practice if that might make me look like I've, I've been getting money and I haven't been disclosing it? Will I get penalized for that? Versus that working for me to be able to be eligible for the self-employment program. So these are like real tensions that, arts administrators, and also folks in the legal clinics could help young artists figure out because it's it's like way too much for one person on their own to try and figure out all these, um, again, these like subjective things like, can I, can I um, expense monthly fuel for my car? Can I expense monthly the cost of my cell phone because I use it for my business? Can I expense monthly the cost of my studio where I live, but I also make my art? Because if you can expense those things, you get to hold on to that money. It gets, de it gets deducted from uh, uh, the money that is taken away from you, which is to say you get to hold on to more money if you can show that you're spending money on ex uh, expenses for your business. So that is one of the benefits of the self-employment program. So too, if you're like, I'm spending $100 a month on arts materials, you would get to hold on to that money, which is to say... It doesn't, it, uh, it, it allows you to hold more money from your profit each month. This is key. Okay, I've been saying a lot, so I'm gonna pause again and just make sure that uh, Julian, you can like flow the conversation in the way you want. I don't know if y'all can tell, I feel some passion about this stuff. <laughs> yes, I think we're all very passionate about this. And um, Ashley, You've heard uh, some of the things that Nadia is talking about in regards to becoming legitimized, for lack of a better word, uh, as an artist in the eyes of OW or ODSP. 
Um, as an artist who's engaged in a lot of different community art spaces in the city, how prepared is the sector, do you think, to be able to meet some of those needs, such as a business plan or advice around budgeting or some of the things that are maybe support your arts engagement versus your actual arts engagement? Um, first off, thank you, Natty. I love you. Um, uh, this question, I think it is a matter of, for the folks who saw me in the last panel, I think this lends itself to me talking about policy versus people and people before policy is, and the comment I made about maintaining space, about when you build a table to include people, maintenance of that table includes adaptation and accommodation. And so the issue is right now is that we, like the government has created this concept of people not on OW or DSP uh, require a particular amount of money to survive. But that hasn't been accommodated for the people on OW and ODSP and they have they're receiving funds that are not living wages and are trying to subsidize that by becoming legitimate self-employed artists. And there's not policy that is meeting that. The, the one piece of policy that is attempting to bridge that gap was the 2017-2018 uh, edition of the arts grants. Sure, but the problem is, is that that wasn't properly rolled out in a capacity where all folks involved, whether the recipients or the OW, ODSP workers, and the arts administrators who are actually the granting bodies are aware of this. It was kind of like a PR um, little press clipping that no one read. And the problem that follows that is that it's, it's touching on what Olympia said, is that the wrong people are having to educate the wrong people. It should be that the, if there's going to be new legislation, the policies should be reformatted. They should be inclusive of new discoveries of new identities, new discoveries of inclusion of who is on OW, who is on ODSP, and the intersections that lie within. And I think a way that the arts industry can help support that, especially the arts administrators and the creative leaders, is by providing workshops and, and other programs that don't just lend themselves to an art practice in the sense of creating talent and skills, like an art skill of painting or dancing. Those are extremely important and we do need to embrace artists um, exploring their arts practice and broadening their horizons on that. But we also need to include programming that is accessible outside of the academic world of going back to post-secondary or anything of that nature. Because again, most folks on ODSP, that's not something that's accessible for them. Is we need to create programming that is about how do you how do you become an artist especially in toronto in ontario and how do you continue to be an artist within this province with the current policies and how and what policies need to change what policies need to shift and so um, an example of a very productive program is Sketch recently introduced the Artist Toolkit. And those gave um, different sessions to folks of how they can become more, for lack of a better term, more literate in the business side of their art. And like, same as Natty said, is that you may not want to actually commodify your art, but there is as someone on ODSP or OW, there is somewhat of a requirement of it if you're trying to use that to fill the gap of your, of your wages. And you have to go through the entire process of proving you can modify it. Um, it's, uh, with the artist toolkit, there, were, there was programming for like how to do your taxes as an artist using language 
that centered around artists realizing the nuance of expenses of an artist. For example, um, a lot of CPAs and accountants would be able to do an office worker's taxes very easily and be like, oh yeah, of course you can write off pens. Everyone knows that pens is an office tool, so you can write that off. But they wouldn't necessarily, unless they have an informed experience with artists, know that yes, you can write off lipstick as an actor. That is a necessary office tool for an actor to be able to perform their artistry. And so there are programs out there that like sketches introduced of artist-based taxes. There's a literacy 101. Um, I was actually um, I was actually very happy to be part of it. I was able to do a um, an organization. I was able to do an organization workshop on how to manage your time well, including crip time and rest, and uh, plan out your grants and plan out your projects. These are things that don't dismiss painting classes and dancing classes and other types of ways to encourage your arts practice. These are applicable workshops that arts organizations and arts administrators should be offering to further support and boost an arts practice because this will give artists the possible opportunity to become more independent and more conscious of how they're navigating through finances and ODSP without being so reliant on this big bubble of question marks because no one else seems to know what's going on. So it's a matter of being able to lean on arts administrators in a way that can show how to be self-sufficient and navigate the system, but then also a responsibility to OW and ODSP workers of their needs, of, like I said, their needs to be training every time a policy changes, every time a policy shifts. It shouldn't just be a memo that people can easily delete and just not pay attention to. There needs to be a new form of training every time something shifts in order to be able to provide assistance because it shouldn't be folks who are recipients of, uh, of these benefits having to, having to beg to be seen and, and be cared for. Thank you so much. Um, so we're just in the beginning of this process. We're offering some training later on this summer in uh, late to mid-August to uh, arts administrators, so stay tuned, as well as artists and OW workers, because we believe everybody needs to gather around this kind of conversation. Um, as a final couple words, I don't know if you would have, either of you would have advice to arts administrators or to other artists or to uh, workers. Okay. Um, since we're not at the point of actually implementing the training and making it mandatory every time there's a policy shift, my advice is start asking more questions. If there seems to be a budget out there but no one is taking part of that budget, if there are resources that exist but they're not coming off the shelves and the inventory is always full, ask questions as to why. Ask questions as to why a particular community is not accessing the resources that are apparently made for them. And do what you can to reach out, do community outreach by contacting people like Sketch and Five Arts and Artreach and Mia Center and all these organizations that have close contact with the recipients, with the artists, instead of waiting for the artists to maybe apply for your grant ask why and how we can better we can better outreach to folks that they can feel safe applying for grants and they can feel confident and they can have the space and the the rights to create their projects. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. Uh, thank you so much for uh, those of you who are tuning in, everybody in the room, to Maggie. Uh, to Olympia, to Ashley, uh, I deeply appreciate this. 
I want to say we are in the middle of an election right now. Every couple of cycles, some politician is like, I'm going to live on welfare rates for a week. I've never seen one last the week. Right? I've never seen one. I've seen a lot of them try. I've never seen one of them last a week. Right now, we're asking artists to somehow survive and create in those conditions. So if there's any politicians listening, you know, lean into the arts of creativity because it's a solution, it's not a problem. And also the amount of people of WPA the, the amount they receive hasn't changed in quite a while, but inflation has, like, I would say double. So it takes up, like, my whole check within, like, three weeks of groceries, and, like, like and then it's gone. And that's not doing anything else. Like, no, anything fun or things I buy on the side, I do from getting cash from the art I Alright, thank you everybody. And now we're going to uh, move. Are, are there any questions? Yeah, there's a couple questions from the chat. Uh, the first question is, what kind of public policy change do you think would in fact make it easier for artists and put people first? I'm going to take a really short, uh, we're even trying to discover what policy currently exists and that artists actually have access to, but are not yet uh, accessing, because that's a whole other thing. We do also, but I'd love to hear your guys' answer to that. The um, well, one thing I would say is that there is a rule that every time uh, inflation goes up, that low-wage workers get an increase in their pay. It's not a raise, it's just to match inflation. That should be a rule for any sort of benefits. If, especially since the benefits are coming from the government, they have full control of matching inflation. So the fact that it has an increase, and I, I'm quite sure that it's more than double, um, it, it's a very staggering difference I think that's the first policy, is that no matter what, the budget increases to match inflation. And also I feel like the $1,000 cap thing deters people from working hard and making money, and I understand it's like, well, we're trying to be as cheap as possible, so they're making this much, I'm fucking making it. But if they got rid of that rule or made it to like, I don't know what like the, the standard of, let's just say for an example, $50,000 is a good living wage that most people experience happiness on and don't have to go to, night, go to sleep every night worried about being poor. I feel like people in OW or ODSP should be able to make up a, to amount, a, like up about to amount that much so that we can feel, why do we, just because we're disabled, have to stress about stuff? Nobody wants to, like, have to depend on OD. Well, there's a few, but there's a few of everything. Nobody wants to, like, be on ODSP and not be able to have a credit card to rent a car or to have to build your credit so that you can buy land and you know, do, like, invest money back into your own community. Nobody would rather be poor, so I feel like the policy should be to scrap that thousand, and you should be able to make as much as every other person can make, and if you go over, that's when I feel like, yeah, okay, we'll take money from that to support other people in ODSP, who don't make this amount, and if you feel like you're making a, a good amount and you don't want any money taken from you, get off ODSP and pay taxes. It's, it's going to be the same, but uh, they want us in this low, low tax bracket. It used to be like $200 until February. Yeah, I think that's a good Any other questions? Question from the chat. This legal vote. Legal Lab program is incredible. Are y'all putting together a doc 
that you can share with the sector about these roles. We are in the middle of putting together three themes that will be uh, attached to our uh, training. Our workshops will be offered in August. And these are some of the zine for you right here. It might take a while because it's important information and I feel like it's going to be a living document. So we want it to be the best quality it can be so that it will be as useful. If we just pump out some piece of shit and nobody can like understand it or read it. Oh, swear, sorry. It's useless. <laughs> like if you spend more time and make it you know, make it more successful and help more people, I feel like everyone agrees that's better than if we literally go copy paste some paragraphs and send it in. Like we can do that on our own time. Woo. We have one more question. Uh, how has the online digital world impacted the art self-employment sector space? And how has the growth of competition online uh, impacted marginalized artists, as well as who gets well-known within the online environment by the internet viewers? landscape of being an artist is grueling and toxic because it used to be back in the day that you had a PR team, you had an agent, you had a marketing team, you had people in the, like, in departments. You were the artist, you were the artist, and all you did is you showed up, you created, you got your picture taken, and you got paid. And you had all these people who maintained your persona. That doesn't exist anymore, especially with the invention of Instagram and influencers. The landscape has really shifted because it's not just that it's like one painter to one painter in a perceived competition or one dancer to a dancer. It's people who are also fighting AI. That's a whole other conversation. But it's, um, it's that we are also competing with content creators and with influencers who aren't actually even in the same category as us, but they are flooding the same streams for us to get noticed. Um, so yeah, it's extremely difficult and I feel like this has really made things difficult for Mark. It's made difficult for all artists, but especially marginalized artists, because this is when we start speaking about privilege because folks who aren't on ODSP, folks who have access to disposable income, they can pay assistance. They can start paying for a marketing team. They can start paying for that blue check to get noticed. But the folks who can't afford this and are struggling to actually present themselves as self-employed um, self artists, it's cart before horse at this point. It's a catch-22 of I can't prove that I'm an artist until I can get the uh, get that blue check, until I can get all of these followers, and I can't get these followers until I can prove that I'm an artist. And so it's not a pretty sight. Also a thing of privilege is, especially I would say white people and even more white men, their apartment is paid for by their parents, or if they get money, they have an allowance, they have a trust fund. So they can sit at home all day and do art and work through their process in this nice individual space that they don't have to share with other people. Their parents are paying the top quality schooling, the top quality supplies. Well, people on ODSP or people who aren't ODSP because they've been gatekeeping so that they deserve to be on ODSP or OW. They have to fight tooth and nail to get supplies, so they have to work double as hard just to be able to start making the art, let alone like these other people spend all day making the art, whereas say, as other people spend half the day trying to be able to survive and cover costs in order to make the art the other half. Ashley, Olympia, Maddie, wherever you are, 
Thank you so much, and uh, stay tuned for more on Sketch Legal Lab. Thank you both.